I'm going to um, put out the recording here. So we have been you know, talking about uh, these sort of plots. And it was noted that um, there's uh, a lot going on here. There's a lot of, um, of, of you know, moving parts and um, uh, data, data shown. Uh, first of all, could we simplify our life by taking what's shown and uh, show it, for example, in a, uh, in a 2D fashion, right, um, with a, a 2D plot. And uh, we could do that with embedding. Um, uh, the issue with embedding is that we are actually reconstructing this space um, from a single time point, right? And if we were to do so from, uh, so, so each data point here is constructed uh, that's shown. Is is uh, reflects um, three uh, three data points in the original time series. The current, you know, the, the value at a certain time, one one week before that time for tau equals seven, and and time is days, and two weeks before that point for um, uh, two weeks before that point here, and uh, we could try to project this down into two dimensions. What, what you'd be doing is projecting it onto uh, a, onto a uh, you know, a, a flat uh, surface here, a plane. So for example, we could take this and you could see what it would look like here if we were to project it in two dimensions, right? And you would indeed see much structure here. Um, it would be actually quite successful at capturing the fact that there are loops capturing you know uh, where we're at now and where we might be going um, uh, similarly you can project it down this way which uh, would also capture some features uh, of that quite well so in many of these cases uh, you could do that uh, very successfully um, and and that would be um, probably for this face space plot uh, recently be successful because the projection of it captures much of that structure. If we were to look at this plot, um, which is not using embedding, but which is which, using, um, uh, using instead. Um, and your uh, screen is not being shared. At the oh, thank you. Thank you, man. Um, uh, thanks. Uh, there we go. Thank you for, for letting me know. Um, yeah, so uh, I had been describing, just so you could see what I was uh, commenting on, I had been commenting on this one here um, and saying that projecting it down would be viewing it, say, from this face um, in 2D or viewing it from this face in 2D, for example. Those would be two different ways. This would be a third way we could project it down. Any of those would be fairly successful in, in capturing these trajectories, the loops involved, capturing where we are now and where we're going. So in this case, you know, a, a, a 2D structure would be uh, reasonably successful in capturing the essential features. There are cases where we have systems uh, which are involved somewhat more state and where a 3D plot portrait really brings out a lot more information. Um, the, the theory of delay embedding doesn't guarantee that we can capture the state space in two dimensions, nor specifically in three, but the more dimensions you add, the more likely it is you're gonna be able to capture some additional aspects of, of state. If it's a, only intrinsically a two dimensional dynamics you're observing, um, Two dimensions might be um, might be enough, and in this case, I think they would do actually a quite good job. Uh, so that's perfectly reasonable uh, idea. We were looking, however, at this uh, data, you know, plot as well, and I noted that uh, you know the story here is a bit more mixed. Like for for these waves here really this third dimension doesn't add a lot. I mean, the active cases looks like it's just a linear function 
of, in this case, cases. Um, so if we have cases, we could more or less say what active cases is. It doesn't add new information materially. Um, there's a bit of fluctuations around here, but it, you know, really it's not adding a lot of new information. And when it comes to data science, we're interested in bringing in additional additional uh, types of data where they add new information. If they're merely a, a combination of what we have already, we haven't really brought anything new to the table. We're not gonna be able to do something with that new data we couldn't do already. But um, you know, instead we look to data sources that are in some sense independent. And what if the insights that's come from data science came out most forcibly from bioinformatics in the 1990s was the fact that um, if you bring in new information with the data source, even if the data source is lower quality, um, you, can, you can often um, secure much more insight by have bring, having brought that in. Um, in. In health sciences, there's a vaunted tradition um, uh, even for, for some phases of, of uh, recent life of the health sciences, for some eras, it was uh, almost the dominant tradition of sort of a notion of a hierarchy of evidence that, um, you know, we have uh, randomized controlled trials at the top and we have, um, you know, various uh, types of controls, uh, uh, perhaps not randomized, but uh, case cohort studies and, and and uh, carefully controlled uh, or carefully uh, uh, corrected for statistically analyses there and, and successive levels down and with observational studies being down towards the bottom, et cetera. And uh, there's a very strong sense of, you know, wanting to ensure that data is, you know, highest quality data and being suspicious of low quality data. And that used to be the attitude in biology until the advent of bioinformatics where um, there's this real culture clash between, uh, to some degree, computer scientists uh, and, um, and bioinformaticians uh, particularly, and biologists, uh, with biologists preferring very, very controlled, carefully designed, super high quality experiments, and bioinformaticians vaunting for new source, you know, seeking new sources of data, even if they were noisy, because they could add a lot more information to the analysis and thereby allow inference. And it turns out to make a long story short, the bioinformaticians um, attitude won out that you know, there's widely recognized that low quality, you know, even noisy data sources that bring new data to the table, if treated with appropriate care, um, they may be lower quality than a very carefully done time course experiment, for example, in the lab, but um, or very carefully controlled studies, but they uh, they can really increase the power of the analysis. And so, you know, um, uh, the the uh, affymetrics trips or or uh, um, uh, chip, uh, chips that that look at gene expression may be noisy, but can bring a lot of extra data, you know, information to the table. Here, we're not bringing a lot of extra information to the table by active cases. Later in this course, we'll be looking at cases where we bring in noisy data sources that do, things like social media data or search data, for example. Um, so here, you might say two dimensions would be enough. And I'd say, yeah, by and large. But you know, there's this interesting pattern with what looks to be the delta wave here which is actually quite different relationship between active cases and suspect, uh, suspected or confirmed and suspected cases. And um, maybe we could uh, collapse it down to two dimensions, uh, but you know, if we were to eliminate the active case dimension and only deal with deaths, for example, and, and confirmed cases, um, we would be uh, losing some aspect of that information that we're gaining from the active cases for, for that wave. 
So uh, by and large, two dimensions would be uh, pretty instructive here. It would gain you most of what you're getting through three, but, but wouldn't capture some of these patterns. Um, uh, but yeah, we can could, we could make use of, of um, two dimensions fairly readily with this data. There are cases, as I say, of systems where you really need the three dimensions to bring out the salient features uh, that you want and to project forward reliably. I'm actually not sure we could project forward here uh, as reliably with just two dimensions. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you why this is here. Um, if we were to, to want to move beyond just sort of exploration visually to project forward, if we were looking at two dimensions here, um, we might not be able to capture the movements along this trajectory uh, as well, because we're kind of projecting it down. You'll notice there's very variable movements here. With three dimensions, we can capture rather well what's going on because there's an sort of an angular movement that's occurring in the dimension that's collapsed into the page that's lost here. So we could project this forward uh, along a certain line much better in three dimensions than two, for example. Um, and I would argue that's probably the case here. So if you were doing simplex projection, if you wanted to anticipate where things are going, where are deaths likely to go in the next little bit, probably in three dimensions, we could do a better job of projecting forward and anticipating deaths in a week or two weeks than we could with merely, uh, with merely two dimensions. And if we pick two dimensions, we'd wanna pick carefully. Like this would not be a very handy two-dimensional projection to use uh, because it is, it, there's, there's too much of the movement that's kind of collapsed down by the projection. Um, here, I think you probably would want three dimensions to the projection. Uh, that would capture more, more of the sort of salient movement of the trajectory. And really what you're capturing is more of the dynamics of the underlying state space as captured through embedding. So um, I'll just note that it's, it's a good thought. We look for economies. And certainly what's very important is if we're looking at data to use a lens that's most uh, handy. 2D gives us, is often the most easy lens to use. It's, the, um, it's a lens which provides us uh, the most information um, uh, in the greatest economy of of um, of expression, you know, we can we can put it down on a page, but three dimensions sometimes does buy us more when it comes to projection using simplex projection, for example. Um, three often gives uh, more information than two, and sometimes visually three gives more. We um, I don't know how many uh, people here are familiar with uh, virtual reality technology, and particularly the use of what's called uh, the, uh, the Oculus system. Um, uh, these days, it, it was recently acquired by Facebook, but it's a 3D data, uh, or it's a 3D visualization system, mostly used for games. Uh, we use it for visualization of these sort of plots in 3D. And there, there, there are times that you can eke out a lot more structure in those three dimensions. You can just recognize patterns that are very hard to see when you have just two dimensions. Sanju. Um, so quick question. So we're humans, so we can kind of imagine where the trajectories are going just by looking mm -hmm. at it. But how would you, what are some of the strategies to objectively determine the projection of the trajectories? Yeah. Is that possible? So, yes, it is. And there's, um, uh, this gets into um, a, a, a uh, a, a set of techniques that are known as time series forecasting. Um, and generally there's techniques known as time series methods. Um, and, uh, and there are a set of, uh, a set of these techniques 
some of which are supported in R. Um, the um, uh, there's a there's some of them that are based on kind of nearest neighbors forecasting and essentially when you have an embedding of the space like we did there so we we're viewing cases now cases a week ago cases two weeks ago um uh you're basically uh, uh using data on most recent data points uh and a certain um uh a certain way of of processing the data from those successive data points that would uh would sort of project forward. If anyone's interested in this, and I'm going to paste into the into the chat here a link, um, I would suggest uh, as a particularly uh, uh, particularly sort of good basic reference here this uh, dynamical forecasting uh, methods um, uh, chapter within this time series analysis handbook that's online. Uh, and and that discusses uh, some of these techniques for projecting forward uh, within this embedded space. Uh, there's also a very good book uh, by Holger uh, called uh, Time Series Analysis, which approaches this um, and uh, discusses the sort of underlying dynamical systems perspective on it. So uh, if anyone's interested in, in diving more into that, you'll find uh, you know, significant discussion that links into what we've been covering in class, uh, Taken's theorem um, and uh, this embedding, and then ways of using the embedded data points to project forward. And um, I won't say that that projection, while looking at these, at these uh, patterns uh, is, is kind of model independent, Projection forward involves a statistical model of sorts, right? It's it's combining recent data points with a certain weighting to, to project forward. And there is a statistical model of sorts there. It's a statistical model rather than a dynamic model. So we're not we're not you know assuming an SIR structure, an SEIR structure, an SEIRS or something like that. Instead, it's kind of we're just processing data points in the delay embedding embedded data, you know, time series. And uh, there's a bit of model components there, but we're also leveraging the theory of dynamical systems in the very uh, process of doing a delayed embedding. Um, so hopefully those comments sort of help. I'd suggest taking a look at that reference and I'm glad to discuss with people. In R, there are these uh, some nice libraries for using simplex projection in data of this sort that if people are interested, I could refer you to. Uh, it can be very effective. You can, um, in some cases, you can project forward using a single time series uh, in a way that captures and this is the power of it, right? Because you're dealing with an embedding, it captures implicitly the effects of other state variables. Um, if, if we just had a time series, most recent data points of that time series of cases, and we tried to project forward, we wouldn't uh, directly be, we, we wouldn't be um, effectively taking into account other state variables, um, you know, uh, susceptibles or, or the number of people that are uh, that are currently exposed for recent exposure, or what have you. Whereas, if we deal with the delay embedding um, through Taken's theorem, that is going to be a reflection of underlying state space, and so we're taking a broader set of state variables into account than we would if we were simply dealing with a time series naively projecting forward the most recent data points in the time series. Projecting the most recent points and embedding the space of a time series can be much more effective than projecting forward from the most recent observations of a single time series, um, because we're taking into account more of the state space structure through the embedding process. Anyway, those are some, some comments there. Any final questions or discussions about this? Uh, 
I'll, I'm, I'm going to have to wrap up with kind of a conclusion of our last lecture and set us up for going through calibration on Friday. Questions? Okay, hearing, hearing none, I'm going to uh, go and we will uh, take the last minutes of this lecture to go to talk a little bit more about, uh, to give closure on what we had spoken about last time, which is dynamic model parameterization. So I, I noted that the key role uh, that uh, model parameterization plays. Models are, dynamic models are about a lot more than data. They're about structure. Um, and uh, it's said in the system dynamics world, structure determines behavior. The structure in a model determines the structure we see at runtime in the, the patterns that are produced. Um, the structure of the underlying system in the world is reflected in the structure in that data. In those patterns we saw are reflected the structure in the underlying world, whether it's data collection, declaring active cases to be, you know, all cases are considered active for three weeks. It's going to impose certain structure on the data. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, the fact that Delta um, is occurring, um, you know, with, with greater uh, virulence than Omicron is reflected in that data as well. Um, parameterization, uh, you know, adjusts certain uh, features of a model within that structure and can yield different, different patterns. And particularly if we're seeking to build a model, which, you know, where we're, we're looking for quantitative insights from it, parameterization is very important. And, and we noted it's, it's a ubiquitous need for models, um, whether it's infectious disease models or chronic disease models or what have you. And last time I had noted uh, briefly, you know, the typically when we build a model, um, we have to turn to many sources of data. I used the rather ungainly analogy of being a data buzzard um, and, and, you know, going in and eking out whatever data I can um, from, from different sources. Um, many of those on the call will be familiar with this, so I won't dwell on it. But, you know, we had spent most of the time last time looking at how we could turn uh, data on behavior of a model um, into estimates for parameters. And we had gone through a rather involved process and noted that we could drive an expression in terms of model parameters um, and quantities we were seeking to estimate, like the basic reproductive number, products of them here, um, from, from observed data. Um, and using observed data and some information, say about recovery times, we could arrive at an estimate of the basic reproductive number. Um, uh, and uh, you know, I noted the the type of curves we were dealing with. These kind of exponential curves early on in an outbreak are ubiquitous. Um, they're all around us. Uh, but I noted that the formulas we use to turn that data into estimates for parameters will vary by our dynamic modeling assumptions. Um, this is unlike those techniques we were just exploring with, um, with the state space plots, which are model independent. Um, even those involving state space embedding are model independent. Um, we're not imposing any assumptions about them of a structure of a model where we're letting the data speak for itself in a way that's guaranteed to be reflective of the underlying state space of whatever system is driving it without imposing model structure. But here, if we have an SCIR model, we have a different rule for how we compute R0. If we assume an SEIR underlying structure of the system, we have a different rule for computing R0 based on the parameters of this model than if we are assuming an SE, SSIR model. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, for we have to 
say, okay, what sort of system do we think this is? And, and it derive the eigenvalues from the Jacobian matrix of that system around the disease-free equilibrium. It's quite a mouthful, I know. And, and we can arrive at some understanding about how the model behaves around the disease-free equilibrium if it's unstable. In other words, if it, an, an outbreak could take off, and we relate that to the basic reproductive number um, and basically create an expression for how we can express the basic reproductive number for that model in terms of the observed data. Um, and I'll be asking you to undertake an exercise with uh, the R0 or R naught library in R and some empirical data to arrive at an estimate of, of R naught. Okay. So, uh, so this is uh, important, important steps. Um, I want to emphasize that, you know, when we're going and estimating parameters, there are certain processes we use uh, routinely to aid that process. One of them is sensitivity analysis. So we take our dynamic model and we perform analysis on, uh, to, to study that investigates how sensitive the results of that model are to certain parameters. And this helps us identify parameters that, to which it's particularly sensitive. Um, uh, and those parameters, it's worth sweating. It's worth putting more emphasis into collecting data for those. Some parameters might have very little impact for the rate, for the, modes of behavior we're looking at compared to others. And it's worth knowing which parameters matter the most in terms of the outcomes we're looking at or the trade-offs uh, between, you know, what if scenarios we're looking at. Um, so we can help identify parameters that really matter. Um, now, it's very common that we don't have reliable information on that can directly give us the value of a parameter, but we have other data. And what we've just looked at with calculating the basic reproductive number from empirical data is an example of it. We don't have data that will give us, hand us on a silver platter as it were, the basic reproductive number. But we have, we have data that, we can relate to the basic reproductive number if we could only estimate other parameters. Um, so for example, here, if we could only estimate um, this mean latent uh, and infectious periods, um, latent period for this, uh, or this is the latent rate, I think, in the, um, uh, I'd have to double check. This may be a rate here, but rather than a, than a mean latent time, I'd have to go check in the model. It is a, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, lambda is, is, the, uh, is the observed rate of growth. Uh, mu is the mean time infectious. Tau is the mean time that one is latent in a latent state. If we had estimates for mu and tau, we could basically arrive at estimates for R naught based on these observed data. And this is very common. We may have data that doesn't directly tell us what is the basic reproductive number, but it, it would let us figure it out with some, with some data we do have. Um, and uh, this relates to this phenomenon of backing out. Um, so often we, we have certain data. Uh, what we'd really like is estimate for a certain parameter. We don't have that. But what we have is other data that together with certain assumptions and empirical observations may, may clue us in with what the value of the parameter is. And sometimes this can be done in a way that doesn't make assumptions. Often we do, we do make assumptions uh, and sometimes they're rather strong assumptions like the two factors are independent or that the system's in equilibrium or, 
or that the the relative risk in one jurisdiction will be the same in the other jurisdiction. Um, and there are times where this amounts to merely algebraic manipulation. So suppose we want to find the sex specific prevalence of diabetes, for example, in a population. And maybe we don't know what that is. We want to build a model where we use this and we, we don't know what it was, what that is. But what we do know is something that can point to that. Um, we know the, say, the breakdown of the population by sex, the fraction of people that are male and female. Um, suppose we know the population-wide prevalence of diabetes. So overall for the population, it's you know, uh, 15%. Um, uh, and maybe we know the prevalence rate ratio in di of diabetes in men compared to women, uh, women compared to men. So we know that women are 0.9 times as likely to have diabetes as, as, as men. Um, well, in, in this case, we could back out through simple algebraic manipulation. Um, and that's the term, backing it out. Um, the sex specific prevalence from this, right? Uh, we could kind of do some manipulation to say what are the uh, uh, what are what are what must these values be if all of if they follow logically from to be consistent with what we do know. Um, and uh, in this case, it's it's a matter of just obvious. Uh, um, obvious kind of algebraic manipulation. Uh, given the time, I'm not gonna go through this, uh, but folks could follow it. Um, so here we're using the relative risk and we're basically solving for one thing in terms of the others. Um, as modelers, we tend to do this fairly frequently. Uh, we don't have exactly what we want, but we have something that can give us what we want. Um, but in other cases, it could involve making assumptions. Um, so for example, maybe we know the so-called marginal prevalence uh, of a condition in rural areas versus urban areas, or in males and versus females. And maybe uh, what we want is, you know, this prevalence among males in rural areas and females in rural areas, males in urban areas and females and um, uh, the, the, one of these is, is opposite. This should be female in, in urban areas, males in urban areas, females in urban areas. Um, and, you know, we, given these marginals, we can't directly, um, um, excuse me, given the count of people in, in each uh, category and each marginal prevalence, we're, we're not going to be able to directly get this. We need at least one other constraint. So we might assume, for example, the, uh, the, the prevalence rate ratio uh, between rural and urban areas uh, for males is the same as uh, the ratio overall. And that would allow us to kind of, uh, to, to get estimates for, for, these, uh, for each of these values. Um, so here we are arriving at, um, uh, understanding of of what these values might be that isn't strictly following from the data, uh, the data we do have, but instead it um, it follows from the data with a simple assumption. Uh, this too is all too often something that we have as modelers are called to do, because we really want these, we don't have them directly but we have something that's close. We impose an assumption, we make it explicit, we state it in our scientific methodology, and we go with it to arrive at some estimates for these values. Next time, um, we're going to be talking about another process that can turn empirical data that doesn't directly give us one particular parameter value into um, into estimates for, uh, for uh, those parameters. And it involves triangulating from diverse time series. This is in line with, it consists and consistent with um, 
with what we see in other spheres uh, uh, that we'll be exploring. Things like uh, the use of approximate Bayesian computation, particle MCMC, um, and Kalman filtering. Uh, here will involve tuning the values of less well-known parameters to best match the observed data. We're taking data we observe from the world that comes from all sorts of parameters, and we're making sure that the model matches it as closely as possible. Um, and sometimes we learn that our model just can't produce the patterns we're, we're looking for it to explain. But often it, it does, and often it allows us to find a reasonable explanation in terms of parameter values that will produce these patterns that we see. Um, so it allows us to arrive at uh, by, by assuming values for different parameters, say beta, mu, and tau here, uh, by finding the point in this space, the so-called parameter space, where the model behavior best matches the observed data, um, then we can um, uh, then we could say, well, you know, a reasonable educated guess for what tau is, for what mu is, what beta is, is this value where the model is best in accordance with what we observed empirically about the behavior of the real world system. Um, and we're saying, you know, those assumptions about parameters are most consistent with that behavior. So we'll go with them. So next time we're gonna be exploring calibration as kind of the first and most naive, most limited way of trying to understand and infer our parameter values given empirical data and give it a model. Much of this course, we'll be exploring more sophisticated methods for doing this uh, with approximate Bayesian computation, with Kalman filtering, to a certain degree with particle filtering, and with particle MCMC. Um, some of those methods give us much more than this. They, they infer the latent state of a stochastic system, which is extraordinarily important beyond this. But many of them have as a key point, the ability to estimate the value of different parameters. So that's where we're going. And calibration is our first step on this journey. So we're gonna be talking about calibration mechanisms, which involve uh, optimization, uh, formal global optimization of the model with respect to data. And we'll talk about um, ways that we can perform that more reliably um, to match multiple lines of data uh, and ways in which we can uh, work through problems that we encounter while calibrating. Okay, that's all we have time for today. Uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, I appreciated the, the dialogue uh, regarding the exercise. Um, and I'm glad we got at least part of that in our, um, in our recording. And uh, I look forward to talking with many of you here on office hours. Um, I hope to, that many of you will be able to make the art tutorial on Wednesday. I'll be posting the Zoom link for that later today. And uh, I look forward to reviewing project proposals that many of you have submitted. So thank you very much. And those who are attending office hours, I'll see you shortly. Take care.